Welcome to the October 21st regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Please take a moment to silence your cell phone. And then tonight we have a special guest. They are Troop 50525, Brownie Troop from, and I think we have members from Plymouth, Adams, and Siebert, correct? Did I miss anyone or any, any elementary schools that you go to? And they are going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. So go ahead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for joining us tonight. President Roush, they are going to stay as long as they can. It might, it might be past your bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to leave at any time. Perfect. Secretary Hadfield, can you take roll for us, please? All right. President Roush. Here. Vice President McFarland. Here. Secretary Hatfield's here. Treasurer Lauterbach. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Ringgold. Here. Member Horowitz. Present. Action item number two is request to address the board regarding our anti-bullying policy. So um, just a little bit of background on this. We'll have two public comment sessions tonight. So this first one is specifically for anti-bullying policy. Um, back in 2022, when we switched from Neola to Thrun, we did a bulk um, acceptance of uh, board policies. We should have actually pulled this one out specifically and did a hearing on it um, in accordance with state law. So this is just to make sure that we do that appropriately. So is there anyone that would like to address the board specifically on our anti-bullying policy and then later on during section four we'll actually vote on it or take action on it? Okay. <clears throat> Item number three is the consent agenda. Item 3.1, approval of the minutes from September 16th regular meeting. Item 3.2, the below staff are being recommended for hire as listed in your agenda packet. Item number 3.3, the below staff announce the resignation effective on the dates as listed on, in your agenda packet. Item 3.4, Administration recommends the renewal of the adult education cooperative agreement between Bullet Creek School District, Coleman Community Schools, Meridian Public Schools, and Midland Public Schools for the 24, 25, 25, 26, and 26, 27 school years. Item number 3.5, our approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of July and August 2024 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $17,006,374 is recommended. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation. And then finally, item 6, 3.6, approval is requested to authorize legal payments to the below list of professional legal fees um, PDKST PLC for $869.25 and then Thrun Law Firm PC for the amount of $2,509. Entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda item 3.1 through 3.6. So moved. Support. Uh, motion by Ringgold. Report by McFarland. Any further discussion or questions on the consent agenda? All in favor of approving items 3.1 through 3.6 say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, at this time, as we've done in the past, we do have um, in item 3.2, two uh, administrative positions that were accepted as part of our um, consent agenda. So just take a moment to recognize Taylor Surgent at Midland High and then Brian Trebilcock at Jefferson Middle School as assistant principal. Um, Taylor and Brian are you here. Congratulations on the roles, and if you want to take a moment to introduce yourself to the community and a little bit of background, it would be great. Thanks. So, my name is Taylor Surgeon. I'm a freshman uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and also, my wife and I are also here. Today, we're currently working on our consent agenda. So, just for the sake of those who still need to sign up, we have some people signed up for last call. And then, we'll just wait until people sign up again. Thanks, Taylor. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Brian Trebilcock. Uh, I'd like to thank the Board of Education, Superintendent, the other members of the administrative team that I've gotten to meet uh, through the interview process. I appreciate the, everyone's time and dedication to that effort. Um, I'm just super excited about this opportunity to work uh, in a great district, at a great school, with a great team. Uh, my wife Liz is with me this evening. She's born and raised in Midland, uh, but we moved back about 10 years ago with our girls to raise them in a great community uh, with great schools. And uh, so I'm very proud now to be a member of the Midland Schools family. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, item number four, presentations um, to the board. Item number 4.1, Shining Stars. Honey. Good evening. I'm excited to present two Shining Stars to you tonight. And we're going to start with Andrew. Come on up. Stand right here by me and be properly recognized. <laughs> Andrew Warner is uh, a music teacher in our district, and we're so thrilled to recognize him tonight. I want to read a few wonderful things about you. Andrew's career highlights. He joined the MPS team in 2022 as a music teacher at Chestnut Hill and Sieber Elementary, which is the position he still currently holds in the district. He earned his Bachelor of Music Education degree from Central Michigan University. I was waiting for Jen Service to say fire up chips. <laughs> Andrew, you were nominated by a colleague who raved about you. There was so much, we couldn't even fit it all on this document. So this is a high level summary of your awesomeness. Uh, this person is recommending Andrew as an MPS shining star because of his work ethic, his ability to connect with students and age groups that span K through 12, I'll just interject while we noted that he works primarily at the elementary. I think we all know that that music department really works as a team and they create this beautiful culture of, of appreciation and love of music and they really do work as a team. Andrew's expertise in the music field and for his willingness to take time out of his day to assist students and MPS staff with various tasks is another reason that he's a shining star. Andrew approaches teaching with a zest. I've heard this. I can't <laughs> wait to come visit. That is infectious and inspiring to be around. Students can sense this, and the overall classroom environment comes alive with his presence. Some of Andrew's many accomplishments include writing music for the Dow and Midland High Bands, producing the largest fifth grade band at Chestnut Hill in years. Oh, is that like a? Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> leading small group percussion sectionals and providing individual assistance at various MPS secondary buildings. 
There is not a greater example of a shining star than Andrew. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome to go to the oh. board if you like. Watch your step. And it's great to see part of that awesome music team here tonight supporting him. Hi, music friends. Our second shining star is Austin Rios. Come stand right here by me, Austin. And don't give me the look you normally give me when I need tech help, <laughs> which is a smile. It's always a smile. Austin joined the MPS team also in 2022 as a help de desk uh, support technician here at the administration building before transitioning to a system engineer position that he currently holds. Austin has his Bachelor of Science degree in cybersecurity from Bellevue University as well as an associate degree in computer information systems from MidMichigan Community College. Austin is very helpful. <laughs> Very helpful. He was nominated by a colleague, and among the many comments are that Austin always goes above and beyond to make sure he completes a task. He always checks in when he arrives, and when he leaves, he makes sure every issue is resolved, no matter what the hurdle he has to jump through to get there. He is beyond helpful and is truly an asset to the Information Technology Department. We are so appreciative of his help at Dow High specifically, but let's just say everywhere in the district. <laughs> During the OK to Say virtual presentation, Austin literally ran around the entire building. <laughs> Did you really? That's, oh, last year. Yeah. <laughs> to make sure that each classroom was up and running. He always works hard, but this is just one example of his extraordinary performance on one specific day. Congratulations on being a shining star. Thank you for all you do. Welcome to go. Always the best part of the evening. Okay. Oh, well, yes. Um, so congratulations to Andrew and Austin on your shining stars. Um, item 4.2 is um, continuing on as we have in previous months, spotlight on excellence throughout the district. Tonight we'll hear from um, Scott Cochran and Max Reed at Dow High on their topic of CTE. Thank you. All right. Oh, thank you, sir. Good evening, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk with you tonight. And I, it was neat to see the, uh, the awards that were just given out. I will say Andrew and Austin both do an excellent job, so we appreciate them. Well, we're here to talk about CTE in general and our auto tech program sp uh, specifically. So uh, real quickly, an overview of what we're going to talk about. We'll talk about some of the classes that we teach at Dow High School in uh, Career Tech Ed. We'll talk about courses our students attend in other places as well, because uh, there truly is a, a county, a district-wide and county-wide partnership when it comes to CTE. Um, we'll talk about some of the off-site work experiences our students have while they're in high school, and then we'll take a, a closer look at the Auto Tech program, which I'm sure you'll agree when we're done is uh, very uh, awesome. It's just excellent. It's a really exciting program. So. Uh, Part, you may not know exactly what CTE entails, and it's one of those things that's always evolving, always changing as uh, the needs in our society change. And so right now, classes that we offer at Dow High, and I, I think many of these are offered at, at Midland High as well, are accounting, uh, an accounting sequence, a computer tech sequence, uh, advanced business classes and classes in business management, uh, which is one of our IB courses. We also have a marketing and merchandising uh, course sequence, those are all offered at both schools. Um, and then at Dow High, we have the Auto Tech Lab. So we have the car care and auto tech sequence. 
And then we have the engineering sequence as well, which has really grown tremendously in the last five to 10 years. Um, just that program is bursting at the seams. And that's a great example when I talked about evolving and changing. There are classes that used to be taught in CTE 10, 15 years ago that are no longer offered. And engineering wasn't there 15 years ago, and it is now. And that kind of evolution will always be happening. Um, students have the opportunity to take a class for one year or even a semester, but they can also take a two-year sequence, which can often lead to uh, college credit and or industry certifications as part of their experience as well. Uh, some of the classes our students take as Dow High students, but they take elsewhere, would be welding and the welding tech sequence, which is extremely popular. Um, it's over at Midland High, an MPS course sequence is very popular there. Also popular at Midland High is the Building Trades program, uh, home building. And then the Agri-Science program up at Coleman always has some students that, and they are true believers. It's an awesome program. And our students there are always very excited to talk about it. And then the Greater Michigan Construction Academy, GMCA, which as opposed to the Building Trades, which is more residential construction, that's more focused on industrial construction. Um, uh, so there's uh, all kinds of different things our students can do. Off-site, and it should be noted, uh, the course sequence I went through earlier, other students from other schools in the county can come to Dow High to take those classes as well, and we have students that do that uh, throughout the county. There are other experiences in CTE that we won't talk about much tonight, but I do want to highlight. Uh, students can take work study where they actually uh, work for two or three hours a day um, as part of their high school experience in paid positions. Uh, they can, uh, one of those is the, uh, we have a healthcare tech sequence where students can work but also earn their uh, CNA certification when they graduate high school, and that's just an awesome program. I think Penny had a lot to do with that program coming to Midland County. And then uh, DECA, which is a business club. Uh, we have one of the largest DECA uh, contingents in the country, and our students are very successful in that program. Ms. Royalty does a great job. But let's talk about auto tech. So this is a, a wonderful example of what CTE looks like in action. So we have uh, several different classes. We have car care, which is a semester long course for students. Uh, you can learn how to work on your tires, learn how to do basic engine maintenance, things that any car owner needs to know. We could all benefit from that. I know I could benefit from taking that class, put it that way. Um, then we have our auto tech class, which is a two hour sequence. So students are in the class for two hours. Max is, Max is gonna tell us about that. We'd be remiss if we didn't point out that there were all kinds of wonderful improvements in the auto tech lab over the last several years. And I'll just let you scan this real quickly, but several new cars, including of course the 2024 Ford Mustang convertible that you heard about last year. That's a pretty sweet car. Um, and then we have probably more important, from the, just as important in the program on a daily basis are the snap-on tools that we have, uh, the pro cut lathes, uh, the balancer, all kinds of great stuff. New garage doors that went up this summer. Uh, which is actually pretty exciting, um, and all kinds of great stuff that Max is going to tell you about. So this is Max Reed. He's one of the students in our program. I asked him to dress as he would dress for auto tech. Hello. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to be walking you through like a normal day for me as an auto tech student. It's a two-hour block, so we'd get there right in the morning. I have first hour, and we'd have about an hour of like your more standard classroom learning. Um, my teacher, Mr. Ransom, does a really good job of having a bunch of different ways to learn something. He understands that there's a lot of hands-on learners, there's a lot of audio-visual learners, and he gives us all different paths to take so that we can get the information we need. And always the second hour of class we'll spend in the lab or the shop doing our lab work or our shop work. As you can see, that Mustang right there is awesome. We love it. <laughs> And uh, right now we're learning a lot about electrical, which is what we're going to be focusing on this year at all. And having that brand new vehicle with all the new bells and whistles is really, really helpful to us to see it function and how it works and learning about the new cars. Like most of us are going to be going into that trade. So having a vehicle like that to study is on is like really helpful. Those machines you see there. Also super helpful. Those are industry standard. You're going to see those in every shop in Midland. And having them to practice on is absolutely amazing. The, those tool benches you see there, we have a ton of those. We have a whole room full of far above industry standard. We have snap-on tools, which are absolutely amazing. I mean, no, no shop in Midland has all snap-on tools like we do. They're awesome. <laughs> oh, the, <laughs> the balancer specifically, very helpful because you know everybody needs <laughs> to balance their tires and it is not hard to use at it all, it's just very scary. So, 
it, it is really isn't hard, but after a few days of learning about it, you can slap a tire on there, really anyone, and learn how to balance a tire in 10 minutes. Oh, the the other machine? That's a that's a mounter. I don't that one is hard to use. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that might take a few more days. What are you looking forward to later this year? I am really looking forward to like engine performance. A lot of right what we're doing right now is electrical, but I like I like to hear <laughs> the loud engines of the Mustang and I can't wait to start it up. Is that it? Yeah. All right. We heard there might be questions. <laughs> so, Max, what what year are you? Are you junior? I'm your senior. Senior. <laughs> what do you want to do next? I'm not sure. <laughs> I know. I know. I like cars, which is why I took this class. But I'm going to take two years of the auto tech program at Delta, and then find out what I want to do from there. Okay. And go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> the uh the fiesta it's great uh, the, well um the battery's dead right now so we can't we can't do a whole lot of electrical on that but we have these wonderful power power stations that charge up our batteries for you i'll get back to you on that you know, actually, i would say you know until last year like that 2014 was the was the new car right and and it's it's always a challenge cars are expensive as we know and so we have wonderful community partners, several of the dealerships in town that have helped us out. Uh, but it, no kidding, Lance was excited to have the 2014 to work on. And because uh, there was more modern systems that our students could learn from. Now, obviously, with the 2024, there's even more. So, uh, but it just means there's more students that can be involved and in, in learning what they need to learn at the same time. So. Just like um, basic electrical is what we're working on right now, and it is so not hard to do some of the things that you see, like in movies or on TV, and it really is not that hard. And if you spent, if anyone spent a day or two in this class, you could learn how to do very basic electrical repairs in your car. When most likely, what almost everyone does is pay someone two hundred dollars an hour to do it, and being able to fix it yourself in ten minutes for thirty bucks is really nice. You're the guy charging. Bucks an hour. It's the really great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Max, can you tell us about a couple projects that you've done with the Mustang or, or that your class has done with the Mustang? Ooh, I'm not really allowed to touch the Mustang that much, but <laughs> we, we had um, most recent lab was with a, a DMM, a digital multimeter. And we used the Mustang and its battery to, uh, we were just working on finding like source ground for our electrical tools. You need to have a good ground if you want anything electrical to function. So we popped the hood on there and uh, we were working on finding source ground, especially in the new sports cars. They'll always have like a roll bar on top of the engine and those are, you don't see that a lot. So it was nice to have an example of that. Okay. It is the end of the first mark, or the beginning of the second mark and It'll get more exciting. All right, Scott, one question for you. You listed out <clears throat> the programs that Dow High has, and then Midland High has some exclusively, and then we even have students that go to Coleman for agri sciences. Yep. What are the barriers to get students from one building to the other? Is it, is it transportation? Is it psychological? Is it... Yeah, I'm missing my friends. What it? What is the barrier? I think it's the last one. Yeah, I think that you know we've done a, a really good job at all of our schools, uh, Dow High certainly, but also Midland High, and I'm sure the other schools in the county of building this culture that students want to be a part of. They're there with their friends. They they identify as chargers or Chemex or Comets or you know whatever it might be, and so we've removed the other barriers. So we we all have agreed uh, in in the county to offer those classes during first and second hour. Uh, we've provided transportation. We have a bus that goes throughout the county, so students can start at their home high school and go to any of the other high schools that are offering these programs, and then we'll transport them there and we'll transport them back. Um, so that's that's been going on uh, for a number of years now, and so that barrier is removed. We also collaborate on calendars to make sure people know when and where students need to be. Um, but I think there is this 
I don't want to say fear, but there's this comfort in knowing, you know, your, your school that you're in and also you're with your people. And so to take the courage to leave that, um, it, it takes some courage. And so I think that's probably the biggest barrier. But every year we have students that, that do it. So we have students that are very excited about the agri-science program. We have students certainly that I, I talk to every day about what they're doing in welding, and they're just thrilled about that. And likewise, you know, we see students from, from Bullet Creek and from Midland High and from Coleman that come to us for some of our classes. So uh, it's great to see. I'm, I'm glad we do it. It's very worthwhile. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. Well. Thank you. Thanks, Max. It takes a lot of courage to get up in front of us. Appreciate it. All right. Item 4.3 is kindergarten camp. The world of CTE to kindergarten camp. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much for having us tonight. I'm Jen Service, Elementary Curriculum Specialist, and I'm joined by this awesome team uh, to share uh, MPS's journey in kindergarten camp this year. Joining me tonight, I have Melissa Ahern director of the pre-primary center. Both Stephanie May and Amy Richard are kindergarten teachers at Adams Elementary. Sarah DeGroat, kindergarten teacher from Woodcrest Elementary, and Chris Waha, principal of Chestnut Hill. Melissa will kick off our presentation and share a little bit of information with you on how the kindergarten camp journey started at the pre-primary center. Hello everyone. Um, like Jen mentioned, I get to work with our youngest learners in the district over at the pre-primary center. And I wanted to share a little bit about the history of um, kindergarten camp because this is um, our second year with this model with our developmental kindergarten classes um, over at the pre-primary center. Um, so two years ago, um, our developmental kindergarten teachers kind of um, heard from family members downstate in um, the Clarkston area about this new method of um, kind of building kindergarten classes and um, rethinking um, how we build kindergarten classes through a camp model. And so um, with permission from the administration team, we did a little bit of, um, we, we reached out to Clarkson Public Schools and got some information about this um, new way of designing, um, you know, the, the first couple weeks of kindergarten, or in our case, developmental kindergarten. Um, and being a smaller school, we have three developmental kindergarten classes at the pre-primary center. It felt right to, to try it out, of course, with permission from our administration team. Um, and so uh, last school year uh, was our first year with uh, DK Camp. And um, it was a, a big learning experience, but um, definitely a collaborative experience, especially um, being my first year as director at the building. It was kind of the perfect timing to try something new. Um, and so after um, we, we completed our year and we did a lot of reflection and we really felt like um, the new kindergarten approach, which um, the rest of our team here will kind of explain a little bit more about what D, um, kindergarten camp sorry, DK camp, um, looks like. Um, we really felt like we met our goals and um, we really um, hit the mark with what we wanted to get out of the experience. And word kind of started spreading throughout the district about this new approach. And so um, a lot of the elementary principals wanted to hear more about our, our experience. So um, just last year was sharing a lot with our elementary teams about what we did, um, and how, how it went, and it was decided um, as an elementary group that this would be something we wanted to try um, this school year across all of our elementary um, buildings here at MPS. Um, and so we spent a lot of last year informing um, all kindergarten teachers and elementary principals just about how kindergarten camp looks and how it can look. Um, knowing that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to kindergarten camp and that um, other elementary schools, you know, this is how developmental kindergarten approached it our first year, um, but giving um, our elementary buildings, um, you know, that wiggle room to make it unique for their um, setting. And so we kind of had some um, learning opportunities with all the kindergarten teachers. And then, of course, um, in August, um, we kind of kicked it off across the district. So. Um, 
I'll have Jen share a little bit about the why, uh, you know, why kindergarten camp um, is such a beneficial yet unique um, start to the school year. And um, yeah. All right, Jen, come on up. So why camp? First and foremost, to meet the needs of the whole child. As defined by the Michigan Department of Education, the whole child is a unique learner comprised of interacting dimensions such as cognitive, physical, behavioral, social, and emotional. The whole child lives within multiple and interconnected environments, including home, school, and community. Caring for, supporting, and educating the whole child is an essential part of promoting academic achievement. Next, kindergarten camp helps to build a community of learners. You will hear from our teachers tonight, this evening, uh, on the power of the relationships built in kindergarten camp this year. Kindergarten camp helps to create a smooth transition into the school. You will hear a little more tonight about the daily schedule of a day in the life of camp. And finally, camp ensures equitable and balanced classrooms to meet the needs of all students. We want to be sure that students have all of the supports they need to be successful. You will hear tonight firsthand about the fun and positive atmosphere kindergarten camp created for both the students and the teachers. I am going to talk to you about um, the teacher collaboration portion of the kindergarten camp and how we um, were all so excited to try something different to create balanced um, classes. Uh, because in the past, this is actually, I think it's my 14th year teaching kindergarten. Um, and we have always wanted to pre-assess students and kind of see how they were um, before we did class lists. But we had 15 minutes one-on-one. -on -one, so you don't see how the students are when they are interacting with each other and playing with each other. So this approach allowed us to see those um, children in that environment. And uh, to get prepared for this, we did the pre-planning where we, um, as a district, all of the kindergarten teachers got together and listened to the presentation that Melissa had. And we were all super excited and knowing that this was going to be a good thing. Um, and then we went into the summer planning our kindergarten team at Adams worked together to plan our lessons, prep the materials. Um, Tracy Renfro, our principal, also helped to participate in all of that to make sure that we had everything all ready to go. Um, name tags and talking about the logistics and trying to predict how things were going to go. Um, then once we started with the daily check-ins, um, every day after, at either during our common planning time or at the end of the day, our team would get together and debrief and talk about how things went. Did we need to change anything um, and or adjust anything? Um, we also kept an observation log throughout the day to jot down any notes about students and maybe what their strengths are or maybe some weaknesses and how we could create balanced classes once we were finished with, with that. Um, observation time um, and this also gives us an opportunity to to observe the whole child rather than just the academics and things like that when we used to do the pre-assessments in the past um, we also made sure that we had common activities we did our lesson plans and they were all the same for all four classrooms at Adams as well as the materials. So we didn't want to make it where one class seemed like it was having way more fun than another <laughs> one. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they were all fun and um, had some good interactive activities where we were also beginning to learn the curriculum and get um, into the literacy portion of it, which is so important. Um, and we also had common expectations rules for the playground and rules within the classroom we kept that all consistent so consistency was key um, but it was such a valuable experience we might tweak a few things here and there but i think overall we can see the benefits and we are reaping those benefits right now so thank you so much all right i'm talking about family communication and we know how important just families, guardians, 
are, especially when they're launching their kids into kindergarten for the first time. Like this is a big deal for so many. And so amongst the teachers, we had a living Google document so that we would add any ideas that we wanted to send in like a weekly email or an update to parents. And then we would sit down at one of those teacher collaborations. We would sit down and talk, okay, is this ready to send out? And then we would schedule it to be sent out via Synergy at the same exact time. So four o'clock Thursday evening, everybody got the same newsletter and we signed it as a cohesive unit, the kindergarten team. Um, We had a kindergarten open house prior to the first day of school. And each kid, as they entered, they got a book, and then they also got a little sheet of paper with a QR code on it, kind of for like a little scavenger hunt in the classroom. Like, make sure you visit all four kindergarten classrooms, visit all four, or meet all four teachers, find the bathroom, find your cubby, your homeroom, all of that, so that they got acquainted with the school, but then also got to meet each of us, which was great for the parents, great for us, and great for the students. The communication I talked about... That's about it. Then the homework teacher, or sorry, homeroom teacher communication. Um, There was one homeroom teacher for each set of 20 children. And so every morning they would start in that homeroom teacher's classroom. And then every afternoon that homeroom teacher would dismiss the children. So the parents were seeing the same teacher at the beginning of the school day and at the end of the school day. So they felt like they had that connection. If they had a question about, okay, how does hot lunch work? Or when do the gym shoes come to school? Or I don't get this, my kid's scared. They would email the homeroom teacher so they still had that relationship with us. That's it. I'm going to speak about the culture and community that happened um, from kindergarten camp. Um, Kindergarten camp gave the opportunity for all of the kindergarten teachers to then work with and get to know all of the kindergarten students. Normally a kindergarten teacher only gets to know their own classroom of students and then maybe some class, you know, kids here and there. Um, Obviously we know the squeaky wheels always get to be known. Um, But kindergarten camp offered a new feeling of community within the entire grade level. After students were assigned to their year-long classroom, kindergartners would then continue to see other teachers in the hallway and say hi and know us by name. And we would know them by name as well because of the connection we made during kindergarten camp. It created so much school community as all of the students then knew that all the teachers were there to help, not just the one teacher with whom they spend the majority of their day after things were assigned to their um, year-long classroom. As planning and collaboration were so important for the success of kindergarten camp, it also created more unity among the kindergarten teaching teams. We truly were a team. We worked together for all of the students. We would meet at lunch to discuss how things were going. We regularly checked in with one another. And then we continued to follow up with each other after the kids were placed in the year-long classrooms to talk about specific students. And we have such a better connection knowing, oh, I have this student, how are they doing? What's happening with that? And we can um, collaborate and help each other with um, how to help students the best. We were fortunate to have other available staff members at Woodcrest um, assist us during our arrival and dismissal times. They would help students in the hallway to get to where they needed to go at the start of the day, or they would help get to the buses at the end of the day. If you don't know how Woodcrest works, there's two different places where kids come and go if they are a bus or a a pickup drop-off, and we have five buses, so it's a little bit more um, tricky getting them to the buses and to the correct buses. All those logistics during kindergarten camp would not have gone as smoothly without those extra sets of willing hands. So we really appreciated the support given from those other staff members. A lot of teaching teams also got matching t-shirts for kindergarten camp. Um, We were lucky at Woodcrest. um, We had um, shirts made for us from a um, a spouse of one of the kindergarten teachers. And so we ended up having four different colors. So like on Monday, we're all wearing the green one. And Tuesday, we all wore the blue one. (laughs) I know the next day. So we actually wore our kindergarten camp shirts, the entire kindergarten camp. They were clean every day. Don't worry. (laughs) But we had different colors for each day. And so it was so fun wearing those shirts. And then the parents, the students, and staff, they could all sense our teamwork and our partnership that we needed, and that helped make kindergarten camp successful. Um, The students were assigned to cabin groups. They were little woodland animals. And um, as we said, we had, like, tags for the backpack. We had name tags. We had everything coded um, by those cabin groups, and then they would rotate among our classrooms with um, the cabin groups. And that helped the kids also have a sense of belonging for those two weeks. 
So elementary schools a lot of times have school spirit days. Well, kindergarten camp had spirit day every day <laughs> because we had our kindergarten camps and um, our t-shirts and just really we were proud to say we're doing kindergarten camp this year. Um, so I feel that that new format of starting kindergarten, it created so many more connections among the staff, among the students, with the parents and the entire school community. Um, and just for the principal perspective, um, the biggest thing for us was that even with all the logistics and things that went into it, it overall it accomplished its goal. Um, it helped us to better be able to balance out our classrooms and, and give our kindergarten teachers kind of that, that solid start to their year where they're not kind of left in this limbo in that first month of just kind of wondering what this group is going to turn out to be. Um, some things that we're kind of considering and looking at going forward um, the number of rotations per day and like how much is necessary and how much stress is that putting on the students. Um, some of the feedback that we got from students and parents was that um, they started to become connected pretty quickly to their kindergarten teachers and it wasn't their favorite part of the day when they had to move. There was a little anxiety around that. Um, depending on the building, anywhere from three sections up to five sections at some of our bigger elementaries, the way that we're looking at that and how can we ensure that everyone's getting mixed up and we're, we're seeing everything that we need to see but we're not adding any additional stress to the kids' day. Um, the auxiliary schedule presented a, a particular challenge for us. We had cer certain groups when we were kind of getting started that's like they're going to end up going to PE twice before some other students had been there once. Um, so just looking at ways that we can kind of fix that. Now it's a kind of a temporary problem given that it's only six to eight days that it's happening. Um, for example, at our school, after the first four days, we kind of sat down and we're talking about – or are we ready for them to shift permanently so we don't have to continue doing this? Um, we ended up doing two more days and then having the, the students shift into their classes. Um, the biggest thing from our, from our kindergarten teachers is it was wonderful how flexible they were with everything. Uh, on the fly, we had things that we were kind of identifying, things that were confusing. Um, with our, our groups and, and things like that, um, they all had a, a color and then an, an animal, so like the teal bunnies. Um, for some of the kids, it was very confusing. They were just looking down, and they're like, I don't know. what, <laughs> I can't read this yet. Um, so just trying to figure out ways that we can, we can simplify things where it's, it's, a, it's achieving the goal that we want it to, but we're not adding anything into our students' day. So, um, yeah, again, just to reiterate, it, it accomplished the goal that we looked for, and um, hopefully that sets us up to just be a little bit more successful as we get through our school year. Thank you. And finally, next steps. So next spring, we plan to invite kindergarten teachers and building principals together for a debriefing meeting. Teachers are eager to learn about camp experiences in different buildings. They hope to learn tips and tricks from one another to make uh, an even more memorable and smooth uh, kindergarten camp transition to the 25-26 school year. So with that, we would love to hear your feedback and or any questions that you might have for us. Um, so and this is for the kindergarten teachers. Have you found your classrooms to be maybe more balanced than they were in previous years? Yes, definitely. I would definitely say that it's across the board because we have had classes where there are some, um, you know, where they have multiple students that need to go to speech or, you know, that have different needs um, where now it's more balanced academically and, and behavior wise too. Did it create any additional work uh, during your preparation for class this year? <laughs> yes. And if so, how? There really is a lot of work that comes with this. How could it not, right? So we had 98 kids come. They each needed a tag for their backpack that was coded with their name and their animal. They had a name tag. Then we had lists. I mean, the amount of Google Docs that we shared <laughs> among us is pretty incredible. Um, I mean, it was all great. And then again, we did that work. Now we can, you know, we can benefit from that. So again, the first time you do something, it's going to be time intensive. Absolutely, it was a lot. But you know, we had ways to double check. We know that the kids were getting home the right way. We had, we had for us, we had. Um, 
cards that I made getting home. Okay, these kids in these um, this cabin group, this is how they're getting home. But then it can be tricky. Well, on Wednesday and Friday, they ride the bus, but they get picked up on these days. But we had it all coded, and we would double check things, and we would mark things. And um, I feel like it went really smoothly because of the work that we put into it. And again, I'm thinking about going into a next year. Oh, my goodness, that's done. Check. It's done. We just have to tweak things and make it better. We'll be able to reuse a lot of the materials. Some of the name <laughs> tags, though, we will have to throw away. <laughs> I'm just really enjoying hearing like the camaraderie and the support for the teacher teams that came out of this. My question um, is related to like how did you get family feedback? Like you were mentioning, some of the students got a little anxious and things like that. So, what was the process for talking to families and getting their feedback through this? Okay, so mostly it was just meeting them face to face. At Adams, we have we only have one bus and not a lot of kindergartners ride it. So we would go out. We would dismiss about five to ten minutes early before the rest of the kids, so that we would first of all get the kindergartners safe to their parents. But then their parents had ample opportunities to talk with us, having that open house before school started, so that we could ease their fears just as much as their students, and then just that open communication where they could email their homeroom teacher, they could call the office and. Our office, because of the rotations, had the schedule and everything, so they knew exactly where the kid was, whose teacher they were with, what specials they might be at. So there was a lot of different ways, um, including you know just the newsletter that we tried to just put out, like here's our model schedule and all the information. So we tried to curb the questions before we got them, but otherwise the parents were just yeah, otherwise the parents were just emails, and we had really good feedback um, throughout kindergarten camp as well as after that they were very happy with the level of communication that we had and just the the organization of the way that it all went out. And I also think another huge benefit is that the students know all of us as teachers so they feel safe coming to us if they have a problem if their teacher isn't right there um, and I still get hugs daily from students from other classrooms so it just has built a great community. I'll just offer a, a quick insight. So this is, you've all heard me say we want to do things with people, not to or for. I will admit that when Jen brought this idea forth, uh, I think Agenda Group, our, our superintendent team said, okay, why don't we take the next layer of the pilot? Are there two schools for this fall that will want to do this? It's a lot to handle logistically. And the principals came back and said, I don't think you understand. Our kindergarten teachers want this. Mm -hmm. So it's a great example of teachers recognizing an opportunity, willing to put in the work to make it happen, like in it to see the benefit of it and to communicate with parents. It's like the perfect example of how shared leadership really can work. And I do think uh, we're going to continue to see the benefit of this. And another good example of here, Here's what we mutually agree are the expectations, but every school, every team got to decide how to operationalize it, even in the morning. Like I remember coming to Woodcrest the first week, all the kindergartners went to the media center and there was a process for lining them up. Whereas at Central Park, they were outside with little sticks and pictures and they lined up outside and teachers escorted them in. And I'm sure at your schools, there was a slightly different process. So a lot of teacher, uh, autonomy in this to make it fit for their school and and what they needed really excited thank you so much for all of your work on this so I actually had a, an orange fox this year <laughs> <laughs> and, and she she had her kindergarten camp experience um, I will say the one thing that I experienced just to add on to the culture of the building was at um, the carnival this fall you know, we show up and our daughter knew like over half the students that were also at the carnival not in her own classroom so it was really neat to see the culture of the building established so early on in her experience as a kindergartner and then second she actually transferred classrooms uh, assignments and we were thinking to ourselves oh man how is this going to go over when we tell her and it was just no big deal Right, because she had such a relationship with the other two kindergarten teachers already. So it was really neat to see that from a balance standpoint, the teacher cohort had a, had an opportunity to make a change that was needed to benefit all the students. And it was just no big deal because those relationships had already been established. So um, 
those were great. I would be remiss if she if she knew that I didn't tell you that she doesn't like the lunch hour set up during the first two weeks, but um, I'm sure you guys will figure that part out. We'll work on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, Jen, thank you for uh, establishing relationships with other public school districts, because anytime we can learn from other districts and then share what we do best, I think everybody has an opportunity to get better. So continue to expand on those opportunities. Thank you. Amy outfit exudes from yes. pencil <laughs> tennis shoes all the way to pencil yeah, yeah. earrings. This is kindergarten. <laughs> I was going to wear a kindergarten camp shirt, but I don't know which color. Yeah. So. Thank you. Weird that every time we read board policy, people leave. <clears throat> All right. Item number 4.4 is for action, the anti bullying policy resolution. Um, I do have to read this one. So the resolution states whereas, consistent with revised school code section 1310B, of MCL 380.1310B, the board held public hearing on October 21st, 2024, concerning proposed policy 5207 anti bullying, which would replace the board's existing policies, bylaws, and administrative guidelines concerning student bullying. And whereas the board has carefully considered proposed policy 5207 on anti bullying, the administration's recommendation and information and commitments, or excuse me, and comments provided during the public hearing. Now, therefore, be it resolved that one, the board accepts the administration's recommendation to adopt policy 5207 anti bullying. Two, policy 5207 anti bullying is hereby adopted and replaces all existing board policies, bylaws, and administrative guidelines concerning student bullying. Three, the board's adoption of policy 5207 will take immediate effect. Four, the administration shall promptly review district <coughs> publications and forms and revise those publications and forms as necessary to align with the newly adopted policy 5207 within 30 calendar days after this resolution. And finally, number five, all resolutions and parts of this resolution insofar as they conflict with the provisions of this resolution B and the same are hereby rescinded. Secretary Hatfield, can you uh, do a roll call vote, please? Absolutely. Uh, President Rausch? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield? Sorry. sorry, sorry, I should actually do yeah. a motion. motion. Let's do a motion. My, my apologies. I move adoption of the uh, resolution as read by President Rausch. Support. Support. Motion by Lauterbach. Support by Ringgold. Sorry. All right, no problem. Yep. President Rausch? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. All right, unanimous. Thank you. Item number 4.5 is for action student ex expulsion of student A. Thank you, yeah. Phil. I have this. <clears throat> A board subcommittee that included members Scott McFarland, John Hatfield, and Ann Horowitz met on October 8, 2024 to consider expulsion for the remainder of the 24-25 school year for student A. Student A was originally suspended for 10 days for assaulting another student. It's the recommendation of the board subcommittee 
that student A be expelled for the remainder of the 24-25 school year. And then as is typical, a copy of the full resolution is part of your board packet. Thank you, Jeff. Take a motion for item 4.5. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Hatfield. Any further discussion? I believe this requires a roll call yeah, as well. It does. All right. Uh, let's see. President Rausch? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. All right. 4.5 passes unanimously. <clears throat> Item number 4.6 for action expulsion of student B. Jeff. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have two tonight, so. Um, the similar language, a board subcommittee that includes members Scott McFarland, John Hatfield, and Ann Horowitz met on October 8th, 2024, to consider expulsion for the rema remainder of the 24-25 school year for student B. Student B was originally suspended for 10 days for assaulting another student. It is the recommendation of the board subcommittee that student B be expelled for the remainder of the 24-25 school year. And again, copy of the resolution is in your agenda packet. I move adoption of the proposed resolution that is uh, at section 4.6 of the agenda. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Horowitz. Secretary Hatfield? Yep. President Rush? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield's yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. Motion carries. Item 4.7 um, is the facility planning survey results and focus group report from Kelsey. She's going to join us from Bannock, Bannock, and Cassidy. Hi, Kelsey. You hear us okay? I think I'm sorry. Oh, I was just on the mop. Okay. All right. All good? Well, good. Welcome, Kelsey. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for your work to get us to this point. Um, looking forward to hearing um, kind of initially from you tonight. Um, just before we get started, um, you know, tonight, as this is part of our regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting, and we still have in front of us a November 11th workshop that's scheduled as a, a special board meeting. Um, just kind of want us to think about three things. One, that this is a this is an overview of the data. So that remember that the survey closed relatively recently. So Kelsey and her team have not had the data all that long. Um, we were very fortunate in that about 1,500 or so of our community members have responded to the online survey, and then she also had a number of. Um, focus groups where she elicited uh, conversational feedback. So there is questions where people were able to provide uh, quantitative um, answers to her uh, the questions that Bannock, Bannock, and Cassidy asked. But then there's a, a whole set of actual written responses that they're trying to work through and, and uh, take all those qualitative responses and, and synthesize the, 
the data. Um, so as we work through this, kind of think to yourself, what are the additional questions that we have for Kelsey? Um, I think, you know, as I've talked to community members, interacted <coughs> with community members, there's probably another, there's, there's like a second layer of questions that I always want to ask. Um, and I, th I think we can have Kelsey help us with maybe extracting some of those second layer questions out of the data and the survey responses. And then <clears throat> um, additionally at the end, you know, we have about three weeks between now and, and, and when we'll be back for the facility uh, or the board workshop on the facility study. What do we want to charge Penny and the administrative team to work on over the next three weeks um, to come back to that meeting with um, to make sure that it's as productive use of our time and, and uh, the community's time for that session, right? What data do we want to have at their p fingertips and, and what do we want them to present back to us? Um, so as Kelsey presents to us, kind of think about those things. I think, um, Kelsey, would you be okay if we have like clarifying questions as you present the data as well? Is that okay with you? As long as I have the answers, I'm happy to clarify anything. Okay. Um, maybe Penny, any other? No, I think that would make okay. I'll just affirm questions are good and we might not have the answers to those tonight, but we will uh, be taking detailed notes so that we can get that information back to you for sure. Okay. So Kelsey, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thanks. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much everyone for having me tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and work through uh, some of the data that we found and present our findings to you. So um, I'm Kelsey. I was the lead researcher on the focus panels on the community survey that we conducted for Midland Public Schools. Um, you're close, Phil. We had uh, 10 focus panels. Four of them were hosted on site. The remainder of them were hosted virtually. And I'm going to give an overview of each session that we did. You were close on the numbers. So on September 24th and 25th, we conducted, like I said, 10 focus panels. Um, they represented key demographics in the Midland Public Schools service area. And they included high school students, uh, longtime residents, two groups of your longtime residents, business and community leaders, nonprofit partners, support staff, preschool and elementary parents, preschool and elementary teachers, um, secondary teachers, and what we did with that, each group is they all started the exact same. I'll give you a little overview here. There you go. Each session began the exact same way. We started by watching a pre-recorded video from Penny, um, and it was information about the scenarios that were being presented uh, that we later asked questions about in the focus panel groups. The survey, relatively the same format. It was open to all community and staff members. Um, it was open from September 27th until October 11.59 on October 11th, so midnight on October 12th, if you will. Um, community and staff members had the opportunity to watch the same video that we used in the focus panels, and we provided the same um, text outline that we read during focus panels when we moved through the series of questions. So they got the same experience as the focus panel participants, just in the convenience of their own home um, and through online instead. <clears throat> we asked the same questions as we did to the focus panel participants regarding the video that they reviewed. We had over 1,600 par uh, community members partake in the survey. That generated over 17,000 open end responses and over 200 people have been at, or have asked to be contacted regarding their questions about facility needs from Midland. So those are all coming to the school district as well uh, to follow up on that information. So I wanna take it step by step. Um, I wanna move through how we started. Our first process was we always like to start in generals with uh, focus panels and community surveys. Why? It gives us a temperature of the community, okay? So we use the net promoter score, pretty common um, assessment used. It's used by lots of businesses. 
And I'm going to share a little bit about that with you, uh, how we did it for Midland. So this is this question is derived to measure school district loyalty or brand loyalty or business loyalty. And we put a value on the school district based on our experience. So we asked participants on a scale of one to 10, where zero is very unlikely, 10 is very likely. How likely are you to recommend Midland Public Schools to a friend or a colleague who is new to the community? Then you take all of that information, all of those numbers and the one through 10 scale, and you turn them into percentages based on where they fall. So zero to six, they're considered detractors, people who don't really care about the school district, the company, um, not really involved. Seven to eight are considered passives. They sit on the fence, they're, they're there, but they don't really swing uh, for you or against you. And then you have your nine through 10, your promoters. They bleed the school colors, they're there volunteering, they're doing all of these great things for the school district. So what you do is you create a percentage of those values from your detractors, passives, or promoters, and then you subtract the total percentage of detractors from the total percentage of promoters. Your scale here is negative 100 to positive 100. Um, so you can see your score right here. In the focus panels, you have a net promoter score of plus 48. From the community survey, you have a net promoter score of plus 37. Now you're probably wondering, these are terrible numbers. No, they're not. They're actually very good numbers. Um, these are really good for a school district. Um, you won't ever see 100. Um, even good companies like Amazon with their amazing return policy will probably never see over a 60 or 70. So these are really good scores, in our opinion, for the school district based on people's loyalty to you. Okay. All right, so knowing that, let's talk about each scenario and the data that we found with each scenario. So how did we get to these trends in the focus panels? I'm going to go through focus panels first and then the survey second for each scenario. When we generalized or when we categorized, we looked at trends. Trends are highlighted right here if they were mentioned more than 10 times in the focus panels. So you will see that scenario A was preferred by focus panel participants, and they like that it maintains the current grade level structure. Uh, they like the construction of the new facilities, the elementary and Northeast. Some were unhappy about Northeast, but they totally understand. Um, and that maintaining the two high schools and the middle schools and the current grade configuration and keeps the opportunities for students either academically, extracurricular, ac uh, athletic wise as well. Um, what they didn't like about scenario A was the movement of pre-K out of Carpenter into the elementary buildings. Um, there's lots of concerns about little kids with big old mean fifth graders, um, which we know that's not true <laughs> sometimes, but there is a concern about that. In addition, the, the type of learning that pre-K individuals have, they are play-based learning, so they're concerned about how they're going to implement that type of learning into an existing elementary school. Um, people view that it's a temporary fix to long-term aging infrastructure needs that the school district needs and aging facilities if we're just putting a band-aid approach on, on, on those infrastructure improvements. They see it as a high project cost um, and they're concerned that it does not include any type of auxiliary facility up, uh, uh, work. One of the common themes that we picked up from focus panels is they preferred scenario A, but they really wanted auxiliary facilities included. And I know that's one portion of data that we're still analyzing, diving a little deeper into those auxiliary facilities and the comments and suggestions related to those. So we'll, we're working on that one. The community survey, all right, again, preferred by survey participants was scenario A. They like that it keeps the middle schools and the high schools separate, their own spaces. Um, it maintains the current grade configuration and keeping the athletic and ac academic opportunities for students the same. And when I mention that, what I'm talking about is when you keep the two high schools, you have two opportunities for like a valedictorian, two opportunities for the first chair of violin, things like that. So that's what they're referencing there. Survey participants don't like that scenario A impacts the uh, elementary level boundaries and efficiencies that pre-K will be moving to the elementary buildings, the cost and the tax increase. 
and that it will require the school district to maintain um, another building by having to um, add another elementary school to, to the school district. So when I'm looking at a comparison between the community survey and the focus panels, your overall focus panel favorability and community survey favorability for scenario A, the weighted average here is 6.17 from focus panels and 5.08 from the community survey. How we did that is a standard calculation of weighted average. We multiplied the data sets by the corresponding weights and then the resulting product, added the resulting products and then divided them by the sum of the weights. So standard average, or I'm sorry, standard weighted average calculation is how we arrived here. Scenario B. <clears throat> All right, focus panel participants liked that scenario B consolidates program offerings into one building. There was lots of discussion about um, uh, you have to go to Midland High to do this. You have to go to Dow High to do this. They liked the idea that everything would be under one roof, if you will. They liked the grade configuration. And I want to highlight that this was a 50-50 toss-up here because uh, focus panel participants also said that they liked, they didn't like the grade configuration. So this is a high occurrence at split 50-50 in your community. Focus panel participants like that uh, scenario B costs less than scenario A, and that all school facilities will be updated. What they don't like about scenario B, it's uh, large buildings for smaller populations of students, uh, specifically five and sixth graders in Dow. Um, they're concerned about just the small two, two grade levels in that building. Um, fewer academic and extracurricular opportunities for students, more students in one building, uh, volume for one spot that's available. Changing the grade configuration, like I mentioned. Uh, increase in transportation costs with the new high school moving students from the south end of the district to the north end of the district or wherever the lo new location will be. Relocating, they didn't like relocating the pre-K to the elementary buildings. Uh, they didn't like that students will re be required to attend multiple buildings and there's lots of change uh, through the academic journey for students. And then they didn't like that there wasn't an identified site for the new high school. The survey kind of mirrors as well. Um, they like that scenario B addresses, they said declining enrollment, that's their perspective. We know that's not the case. However, one of the questions that came up was how long will you be able to maintain, how long will you be able to maintain two high schools because of enrollment? So that is a, something that needs to be addressed in the community of your current enrollment status um, and projections. They like the construction of a new high school for state-of-the-art facilities. Um, they like that facility infrastructure will be improved in current facilities that you have. One thing I want to highlight is you had over th or you had 386 survey respondents say they liked absolutely nothing about scenario B in comparison to the 86 people who said they liked nothing about scenario A. Survey participants didn't like or don't like that scenario B uh, reduces student participation for extracurriculars and academic events or ac um, academics and athletics. They said it changes the grade configuration. They're concerned about overcrowding by moving two buildings into one building um, and the loss of or children falling through the cracks, quote unquote, um, because you have such a large student population, making sure that each student gets the individual attention that they need. There could be a loss of school pride or the crosstown rivalry uh, that what seems to be a very proud thing in Midland. They're afraid to lose that. And they see it as a high cost without very clear benefits for the future of the school district. So comparing the focus panels in the community survey, looking at your weighted average, the favorability from focus panels for scenario B is 4.10. The favorability from the community survey is 3.16. All right, scenario B with auxiliary facilities. So focus panel participants like that scenario B enhances arts and athletics, state-of-the-art facilities, new facilities on the new high school grounds, um, and improves the facilities to attract new talent. So having a new building might bring in more staff, more teachers, um, even more kids into the school district because you'd have state-of-the-art facilities. 
focus panel participants didn't like that scenario B with auxiliary facilities has a high cost and um, operational dollar concerns. Questions arose of how are you going to take care of these facilities? Um, is it in our operational budget? What's the long-term operational cost for this? Um, there's a lack of collaboration with the community of what type of auxiliary facilities are needed and if you could have partnered with the community on creating a pool or an auditorium or um, not necessarily a stadium but a pool and an auditorium. Uh, our scenario B also reduces the opportunity for students per fo uh, focus panel participants and requires multiple building transitions as it's paired with scenario B. Community survey results, survey participants like that scenario B will update important auxiliary facilities. They see the pool, the stadium, and the auditorium as, um, as important in the school district and that it touches for a lot of students. Uh, they like that it will be accessible for all schools. So having the opportunity to use all of these new facilities for all of your schools, uh, they're in support of that. And they like that it supports athletics and extracurricular activities in the sense that you could attract new students or students to a different type of program or extracurricular activity based on those, these facilities. What they don't like about scenario B with auxiliary facilities is the high cost. Um, it doesn't put the community's needs first and is replacing facilities that have recently been updated. Again, I don't know the the last time of auxiliary facility has been updated. This is just their perception. This is what they are thinking. So looking at the comparison between focus panels and the community survey on your weighted average for uh, scenario B with auxiliary facilities, focus panels gave you a favorability score of 4.81 and your community survey gave you a favorability score of 3.76. So after we went through each scenario in the focus panels and the community survey, we asked survey participants and focus panel participants, if the school district, based on what you know, if the school district were to move forward and place a scenario on the ballot in May, 2025, which scenario would you prefer they place on the ballot? Here's your breakdown of that information. So per your focus panels, 53.76% prefer scenario A, the community survey, almost 50% prefer scenario A. Um, focus panels gave scenario B a 15.1% and, and the community survey gave it a 4.66%. B, we call it B plus B with auxiliary facilities. Uh, focus panels gave it a 19.35 and the community survey gave a 14.37. Uh, In there, we also gave the opportunity of not sure or can't say or I can't support any scenario being placed on the ballot. And those representative scores from the focus panels and the community survey are located at the bottom right here. You will see that even though the community is preferring scenario A, uh, it's barely reaching 50%. Uh, so that's something that we'll want to have a discussion about. What we did based on this information is, after this information, we asked a demographic question of their relationship to the school district. So I took each of those relationships and I broke them down and I pulled that same exact question that I just shared with you and compiled it all here. So what you will see on the left hand side, oh, I have a darn fruit fly chasing me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, we have on the left side, a parent with children attending Midlife Public Schools. They represent 69.32% of your survey participants. And then the, on the right, the preference that they choose for the scenario to be placed on the ballot in May 2025. One thing I want to highlight here, you'll see in the top right corner, these will not add up to 100. And the reason for that is when we got to the survey question, we asked people to check all that apply so they can be a parent that also owns a business in Midland Public Schools. So we might have some overlap there and that's why you'll see that, but that's because we asked them to check all that apply. Okay. A lot of information to digest right there, but you have that in your packet, so you can review that at your leisure. The next thing that we have to do is continue diving into some more data, um, breaking down some more of the demographics, making breaking down some more of the in-depth conversations, such as auxiliary facilities, early childhood, um, things like that, and then sharing that with the school district and answering any other questions that you have um, before 
before your next meeting. So I'm gonna flip this over to Penny and she can walk through some next steps for you and the board based on this information that I've shared with you. Thanks, Kelsey. This slide does represent our next steps to move forward. Uh, the final reports are multi-page documents that will take you some time to process. And as Phil said, tonight at the uh, end of this segment, we'll generate lots of questions, I hope, and we'll commit to getting you answers to those so that you can continue to process that individually. We do have study committee meetings where uh, we'll continue to elicit questions and our commitment is that as we identify answers to those questions, we have created a website, a uh, web page to our main website for facility planning and we'll ensure that all of that information is available uh, to the public as well as uh, these slides and the final reports once we have all of those. The November 11th board workshop, as Phil said, will be an opportunity for you all to have just some really open dialogue about how you've processed the information, any additional information or data that you might have collected through your networks in the community, and to really start to coalesce this information in a way where we can find a direction in which to move. And I wanna emphasize that for the sake of clarity and openness to everyone here on the board and anyone who might be listening to the board meeting. That November 11th meeting is where I'm going to listen to understand if you are all reaching a point of consensus. I, I then need to bring a recommendation back to you as a board at that November 18th meeting. That is when there needs to be a strong sense of if, number one, and if yes, then how uh, we're moving forward so that we can begin, uh, you all know as through our previous conversations, there's a host of meetings with Troon, with the Department of Treasury, because ultimately that December meeting is when a resolution comes with that pre-qualification application that has this specific ballot language and all of the other details that will require uh, a board vote. So this timeline is important. It's very important to me that you all have answers to all the questions that you have now and as we continue through this process and that we ensure that the public uh, is informed of what those conversations are looking like um, and are welcome to come to that November 11th meeting. So having said that, Kelsey, unless there's anything else, I think we open it up to generate some questions. And I'll take notes. I know Sarah will. Luckily, our meetings are recorded, so we can play these back and make sure that we really <laughs> capture your questions accurately. And then the team goes to work to get you the answers you need. So anybody have questions for Kelsey to start? And maybe we start with just the data she presented today, if there's any particular questions or wonderings about that, and then we can layer into what else we need to know. I might fumble this a little bit, Kelsey. Um, I had a question. Um, I don't recall if it was community or focus group feedback, but there was a comment about replacing recently updated facilities, and I I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I was wondering if that was just related to auxiliary or if it was related to the actual school buildings. It was related to uh, scenario B with auxiliary facilities. That's where it came up that it sounds like from the interpretation, it sounds like there has been money put into some of the auxiliary facilities recently and people are questioning the need if we've already put money into them. Okay. Was so Go ahead. Go ahead. Was there any, I, I didn't see it, but was anyone asked, were the survey participants or the focus group participants asked when the last time they were in our buildings was? No. Is there a way to, is it, I suppose it's too late. Well. Keep in mind, so, even though they weren't specifically asked that, look at your demographic breakdown of who we surveyed. 
and who were part of the focus panels. I had elementary teachers and secondary teachers. I had parents for each age group there as well. And then I had uh, support staff. So there are people that have been in your buildings. Um, some of the long-term residents might not have been. I know your nonprofit partners, I've, I had their focus panel. Um, they had mentioned that they had been in the buildings. So there is a representation of people who have been in the buildings. I just didn't ask the question specifically, when was the last time you were in the building? To, Thank you. To pull on that thread a little bit, John, Kelsey, is it fair on the slide that says recommended scenarios to replace on the May 2025 ballot? You've got 53, well, I should stick with the community. About 50% of the community and focus group support scenario A, and then somewhere between you know, five and 15% for B and B plus uh, independently. But mm -hmm. then in the bottom right, um, community can't support any scenario 25%, focus group can't support any scenario 7.5%. Can I fairly say that to, to the question I think John is asking, is it fair to interpret that data that 75% of our community survey respondents understand the need to do something to upgrade the facilities that we have? Absolutely, that okay. was that was something that we saw in both of them. They understand the need to take care of what you have. Um, when we surveyed them and when we met with them in the focus panels, you know, we're presenting that you have infrastructure needs that need to be taken care of, but in addition, you're doing these projects, such as building a new elementary, building a new middle school, building a new high school. So I don't think they don't see the need for infrastructure needs. I know they're aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. But they're at the same time saying there's a disconnect between what we want and what we need. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank that you. sounds fair. Okay. Thank you. What do you mean by well, well, it sounded as if they're saying in the survey there's a disconnect between what we're asking for and what we actually need in the community. That came right. through from so, what I was it, reading. Here's the hard thing. When you present three different scenarios, yeah. I'll, I'll share some of the feedback that we heard. Um, a lot of the feedback that we heard was why are auxiliary facilities only paired with scenario A? Okay. So people are wondering that. So when you're looking at this data, it's they're probably picking A because it's the, it's the most known, less change, less disruption, even though it has a higher price tag, it's keeping everything pretty much status quo. However, it's lacking something. It's lacking the auxiliary facilities or it's lacking something better for the pre-K grouping. So just because they're picking A doesn't mean they're 100% happy with it. And that's where you get that can't support because You've got 75% of the pie and they're looking for that extra 25% of change this with the ECC, add auxiliary facilities, and then I can support A. So that's the gap that you're trying to close. Okay. Okay. That's fair. So another question on the data specifically. When I, again, go back to the slide that has what can you support A, B, or B plus, I look at those and say, again, somewhere between 75 and 85%, whether you look at focus group or community feedback, support upgrades to our facilities. And then what our job as a board is to work with our community and figure out which scenario. And if I look at that slide, okay, maybe the answer is pretty clear. But what, what then I look at the rest of your data packet and the weighted, I'm struggling with the connection to what the weighted average score, mm -hmm. like the 4.81 and the, 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 the 6.1, if you look at the focus group, really means. Because the, the separation doesn't look nearly as drastic as it does on, on the ABC. The, yeah, the a, so B, great B question. Plus. So that if you go to, let's see, slide one, one, two, three, four, slide four, or no, that's the net promoter, sorry, four, 
five, six, go to slide seven, okay, where we talk about the focus panel and community survey comparison from scenario A, and that's your favorability. Um, that's your weighted average of people's perception of this. So we ask them on a scale of one to 10, what's your favorability of scenario A? And then they gave their number one through 10. Um, the, the A, B, B plus slide that you're looking at, that's a preference. It's not a weighted average. These are 1,600 people responding to, I prefer this answer versus putting a number scale on it. So the weighted average in this will not add up. That last slide is a reflection of one of the final survey questions that said, if you were, I can't remember the exact language, but if you were to choose, which one would you choose? Correct. Got it. Correct. So on your recommend question, you ask whether they would recommend Midland Public Schools. If they went below seven, were you asking a follow-up question to ask why they would not recommend? So that wasn't, it was a, are you looking at the ABB plus one again? I'm looking at the, uh, the one question that comes up, would you recommend MPS to... I think it's your net yeah. promoter. So your net promoter. Everyone. So when I ask that question on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are yep. you to, re to recommend Midland yep. Public Schools to a friend or colleague who is mm -hmm. new to the community? Yep. I ask everyone, tell me why you feel that way. So I have that number for every person who gave me a 1 through 10. Okay. There's no reason to discern for if someone's saying, I I'll absolutely recommend as opposed so to traditionally from a corporate standpoint or if you're excuse me if you're asking someone in net promoter if they rate it less than like a six or a seven less than a seven you'd say why would you give it that recommendation yep so we ask that question of all of them because we like to know all of that data okay um, but that is something that we can uh, desegregate out and okay. we can give you all of the comments for your passives your detractors okay. and your promoters based on those brackets. Okay. What we also like to do with that is we look at those detractors and see what else they're saying across the board yep. because, or and the, and the promoters even, okay. because we've seen it where we ask that NPS score and they give them a 10 and then we go through the facility updates and they give them a zero and a zero. And if you're gonna put anything on the ballot, what one would you put, choose? And they say nothing, we, I can't support any of it. Okay. So. <laughs> We look at these people that are giving the school district a 10, but can't support anything that we're doing decision-wise, how likely are they really in support of us? Okay. So we, d we dive into all of that okay. data that way as well. Good, thank you. Does anybody have any more questions for Kelsey on specifically the data that was presented to us? I do. Um, the, like the grade configuration piece where it's like, 50 50 um mm -hmm. 50 people say yeah we like the new grade configuration and 50 percent of people say they is there any way to tease that out in regards to like a i mean i don't even know what question you would ask but but for the answer to be they like the grade configuration and then they don't like the grade configuration as a negative mm -hmm. how to like get more in depth into that piece um yes we can do that so from just general overview of what I've looked through so far, uh, people agree with the grade configuration for five and six. Um, they're not really happy about five-year-olds or uh, fifth graders being pulled out, but they understand the five and six breakup. What they really don't like is ninth graders not being included in the high school. I was the first class in high school for ninth grade, so it wasn't that long ago that we were all... <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we've had it both ways in Midland Public Schools. Okay. Um, can, so let's, so staying on that theme, maybe let's pull out the questions that we want to task Kelsey with that she can help us extract from the data. Um, I have a very similar question around pre-K. Mm -hmm. um, the question I have is, I think, is mm -hmm. there's some 
reticence or resistance for from the survey results on pre-K in the elementary buildings. Um, what I was trying to think to myself was, we've got a hundred year old building that's at the end of its useful life. Mm -hmm. Is is there a difference in pre-K and how our survey respondents think about it if it were a really high quality preschool the year immediately before kindergarten in the elementary building versus a, a more daycare experience? Because I recognize that we have three, four, and five-year-olds in Carpenter and wonder if there's, when, when people are answering that question, are they thinking about three, four, and five-year-olds going up to the elementary school with the pre-K experience, or would it just be the one year prior to kindergarten? And can you delineate that data at all? If they gave the age groups, I could point that out. Um, I, overall, they're, I think they're just looking at the pre-K age population in general. Um, I, I can dive into that for you and see what I can find. And the reason I ask is because we, we started with pre-K as just DK in our yeah. elementary buildings. And then we expanded it and expanded it, and then we added younger and younger kids to it. And I'm wondering, as it's evolved, have we solved the problem that is now challenging ourselves in our facility assessment? So. Okay. Um, and then I think I think you already said you were starting to look into another question I had was this question around auxiliary facilities in B plus, yep. if those were put into the scenario A, which which facility, which auxiliary facilities are people really see as a need, um, mm -hmm. and and is it possible to extract from the data? Um, and, and maybe you have to do it from the qualitative responses where people had the written feedback, but how do you pull out which ones are the, the greatest need for the district to, to address in the community's eyes? Okay. Just to add to that, um, can we figure out or find out um, were those responses about the auxiliaries only limited to the options that we provided them? In other words, did anybody say, hey, we could use this type of facility that wasn't on the list or something else that we should be considering? I'll have to look to double check, but from what I have reviewed, the 605 pages of your survey report, it stuck with those facilities. Okay. Brad, anything? Um, kind of have two negatives that are the moving of the pre-K students and changing elementary boundaries. If we're going to solve issues, we have to do those things. We have too many children in our elementary schools as it sits right now. So I understand it is of the top responses included under elementary school concerns, but the capacity has been already met at multiple schools. That's why we're doing this. Um, moving pre-K students is made available by making some changes in the grade configurations and what buildings they go into. But if we stay with A and you're viewing changing elementary boundaries as a negative, um, 
I have concern with people looking at that as a negative when the whole purpose of this is that's the positive where we're going to spend our money to give a better educational experience for our elementary students. We haven't explained our why. That's I, I 100%. Yes. Yes. So the whole reason we're sitting here is because of those two items and that we're even going down this path is for the littles. And that needs to be explained more clearly to our public. That's what I have boiled this down to. You, you raise a really good point, Brad. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we've probably struggled with um, as a district is how do we make sure to um, walk this fine line of communicating out as much as we possibly can without swaying the public one way or the other. On, but you do raise a good point on we can do a better job of continuing to communicate out the needs that we have. Um, and you hit the nail on the head with the critical need um, of addressing pre-K and elementary capacity. Particularly at Northeast. At Northeast. Uh, Carpenter. Carpenter. Yep. Um, any other questions we want Kelsey to extract out of the survey mm -hmm. respondents? Responses? Okay. So that leads to what I think probably the third part of our discussion tonight, which is, you know, I think it would behoove us to charge Penny and her team with some direction to set us up for the most success on November 11th and what we want them to bring to that um, board meeting. So we've talked about what Kelsey has um, for kind of specific action items out of the data. I'm sure Penny will um, work with her on eliciting the, the or, or maybe synthesizing the data responses and, and questions that we have. Our Based on what I'm seeing in front of me, I think it. I think I could safely say that we're probably at a point where our community is telling us, yes, we understand that we have aging facilities. We are in support of, um, in general, of you spending money on your facilities. However, we're much more in support of scenario A, which is to maintain the current uh, secondary grade um, configuration. I think to Brad's point, we do have some more work on elementary capacity and explaining the, the, the critical why um, on the capacity concerns and what that mm -hmm. means because there, there has to be some change, and how we address those changes are, are some of the key concerns. Are we at a point now where we want to really focus on how to do scenario A in the board workshop while addressing the key considerations that we're trying to ask Kelsey and, and Penny to come back with? Or do we, do we still want Penny to come back with um, detailed understanding and assessment from A and B? I, where, where we I mean, we collected all the data. I'd like to see all the data and kind of 
examine it more closely because I think it I think generally it's telling us yes we're the community is absolutely leaning towards a but then there are parts about the auxiliary facilities and so I want to dig into that yep. and I'm also interested in seeing what people liked about B aside from the auxiliary facilities because I think at the beginning of this process we said we're taking these two proposals to the community we know that there will be pros and cons to both. We know the community will like and dislike certain parts of it. And we think we won't end up with exactly one or the other. So I think we need to look at everything together and then figure that out where where we want to land. Because we're not married. We don't have to be married to A. We don't have to be married to B. We have to be married to what is best for the kids and what our community is going to support in mm -hmm. May. And I actually did have a, one question for Kelsey. Could you... Uh, separate the data out by in terms of even further by the cohorts that you ask the questions of so are there significant differences between yeah. um, families with students in the district right now families who put people put kids through the district and uh, third would be uh, just community members looking at looking at this that is one of the next okay. steps that we are taking. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I also um, am, am struggling with, I don't think that there was enough information about some kind of major change in order for people to understand or support something as big as what we're talking about in scenario B. And we keep, I like, if you, like reading through the, the focus group panel data, you know, like the the students in general were like, oh, well, if we had one high school, we'd have access to all the classes. Right. You know, and those sorts of things that that are showing extremely positive, And yet we're seeing this. Well, opportunities would be reduced. Opportunities would be reduced when the feedback is saying, but it would be we'd have increased opportunities. So and I don't know if there's a way to tease that out from the data, but because we don't have a site, because we don't have, there's so many questions, people were like, no, I can't support that because I don't know what you're talking about. And so I'm, um, I mean, like our secondary teachers, if you look at their favorability scores for one high school, they're off the charts. And so, so I think there's a <laughs> lot more questions than answers period before we say oh we're just going with a because that's what this data says um and so i mean like what does it look like to dream of an athletics department and what would the opportunities be what would be available to our kids as opposed to just saying oh well there'd only be one varsity team so that's it yeah, i mean you i know? read one comment that right. said this is a plan for the next hundred years you know, scenario B is a plan for the next hundred years, right. whereas scenario A is in eh, next 10, 15 years. Five years. <laughs> five years, five, five years. Five years, and we're going to have That's to be talking what, again. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> right. And, yep. and like to just just so our audience knows what you're referring to, like favorability scores for secondary teachers B plus 9.08 .8, elementary and preschool parents, B plus with auxiliary 7.5. Right, so it, it is interesting when you look through the the cohort data, mm -hmm. maybe people that are thinking about their students just starting out in the in the buildings as well as the, the teachers that experience um, the buildings on a first-hand basis. Um, we have said all along that you know, the timeline that Penny showed us on the on the the slide, the last slide of the presentation is a tentative yeah. timeline, right? Like mm -hmm. we can always take more time if we need to, but um, I think this board workshop will have a lot of really good discussion on kind of how to extract some of this further information and. We will also post these on our web page so that so I, people can review them. I do have some questions like that could go if we're ready to move yeah. to like the admin team. Um, Kelsey brought up the question from one of the uh, groups in the survey, how long can we maintain two high schools? Um, I mean, what does that look like with athletic fields and 
classes and CTE and, and, and in two different places. And I don't know if there's a way to answer that um, specifically, but to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Um, we have ages of our buildings, but we don't necessarily put in the facilities website page what the lifespan of those buildings are. Um, and, and we do, I think, have that data from the, the facilities plan, not, not just Northeast and Carpenter, but what are we looking at next? I mean, are we going to do all these big renovations to a building that only has 10 more years in it, that kind of thing? Um, so I'd like to know that. Um, I would really love to see our athletic director's dream. What does this look like? Tell us what, what you know, what division, does it change our divisions? Does it change our, like, what does it allow us the capacity to do intramural? You know, if we have one football field that we're using and we have these amazing varsity and JV things and then we use a different building that has freshman stuff, what, how much more can we give to that secondary space? And the same thing from music and drama. Right. What, what music? What do you? We're gonna have. You know, we're you still gonna have six hours of band, so you're still gonna have six first chair. You know, trumpets. They're just gonna be in different arrangements. So. I would like to see uh, from the administration team uh, if we could pull together some performance data or performance data, academic performance data from the middle and high schools. So we can take a look at that. Uh, there's anecdotally a sense that one school outperforms the other, um, and I'd like to see that. And I think that you know some of the additional work that we're doing and looking at these scenarios is really about providing all of the students with the same opportunities. And I think the community needs to understand what that looks like in the end. Because right now, I, it's my sense that uh, students aren't necessarily performing at the same level at both high schools or both uh, uh, middle schools. And I think that really needs to be at the root of what we're looking at, is how do we bring everyone to the same place going forward. I also have questions, and I know I've mentioned this to Brian offline, but about transportation. Um, and that did come up in the survey, that there would be in, a need for increase, increased transportation and what would that cost. But we would also then have the accessibility to provide robust transportation in a way that we don't necessarily do now. And so wondering what that looks like, um, what those costs might be, and, and how we would have to deal with that. I'll just chime in quickly because that is one of those questions mm -hmm. And I want to frame this in, in the right way. So we took a very different approach as a district to proposing two very different ideas to our community. And I accept the feedback about communication not being as in-depth as we might have now wanted it to be looking at those. Scenario B is incredibly complex. There are a lot of moving parts to that. And a question like transportation could take um, many, many hours to mock up, and it is primarily contingent upon uh, how we might adjust school boundaries as well. So I would just um, offer to you all, we can certainly put in the time, the team can find the time to do that, but it will require a tremendous amount of time to mock up a variety of scenarios and put cost estimates to those. So it, I just would ask for you to maybe prioritize those data points that you need. And if that is one that you feel is absolutely necessary for you to make a good decision, then, then we can do that. I mean, I'm looking to the team over here. Tell me if I'm wrong that that's a considerable amount of time. And I guess I'll just go back to, you know, we went down this road a little differently. A lot of other districts would pick that one scenario. They would have a lot of meat and details to it, and they would take it to their community to test it and then come back and refine it based on the feedback they would get. And we've, because of the different approach we had, I think that has sort of framed the layer of detail that we had in this early phase. It was meant to test, to get a pulse of, of what the community wanted. And Kelsey, I mean, chime in here. You do this with yeah. hundreds of districts. It's a little bit different how we've approached this. 
You approached it differently. And what, what Penny is saying is correct. You have given an overview of each project or each scenario um, to go in more, to go in depth more. Um, you basically would have had to pick one and taken your time to focus in on the nitty gritty details of that one scenario. I do want to point out that the school district did disseminate a frequently asked questions document halfway through the survey, um, sharing more information about the scenarios, the current status of facilities, Penny chime in, whatever else you added in there. Um, and based on that being published, there was no change in survey data. And you had quite a few hits, like in the hundreds of people viewing on the first day that was published, people viewing that document. I don't know the total off the top of my head that you shared with me, Penny, but you had a significant amount of people visit that FAQ and there was no difference in the survey timestamp from when we launched it to that FAQ being uh, released and then from that FAQ being released and then the survey closing. So um, I kind of echo Penny on this that I don't know if more information would have given you any different outcome. Is it, am I safe to say that the board would like you to prioritize the student experience though, being curriculum and extracurricular activities of scenario B and what that actually would look like? Sure, we can do that, absolutely. You know, in the FAQ, we took a stab at the opportunity gain loss question that we kept hearing. We <laughs> framed it as, of course, there are opportunities to be gained when you can have more course offerings and that we felt we could mitigate what was perceived as an opportunity loss by offering more varieties, more layers to our athletic teams and our arts and our music. Uh, I'll just offer, we can, again, mock up a variety of different um, prospects, but from the beginning, I shared with you all, that's where the teachers come in and the parents come in mm -hmm. to help us co-create what some of that looks like. So whatever we bring back to you will be, you know, an initial stake in the ground, but knowing that it will yep. evolve over time. And so we'll need to be really clear with our community that these ideas we're bringing forth are just that. They're plausible ideas, not necessarily exactly uh, how this might look when, when it, the doors open. Thank you, Chen. <laughs> can we come back to the preschool conversation for a minute? Uh, if I can just insert yep. myself here. There, it does seem in the data set that, that there is sort of still this question about, you know, the literature calls it centralization versus, de versus decentralization of your preschool programming. Should they be in a center-based program or distributed out? Is there any further detail that you all want about that from the data or uh, from our team? I think I'd like additional information from the administration to um, what the literature says about what is best practice and what is best for the whole child. <laughs> Is there a way to get that from the data? Like the difference between? Of what people prefer, the yeah. centralized or decentralized? Yeah. Because we didn't uh, really ask they that. We won't necessarily have that information, yeah. like the specific language of centralized versus decentralized. What we see is uh, we need our own standalone early childhood center, or we don't like that pre-K is in, uh, being moved to the elementary building. So. Okay. Um, you would take that moving to the elementary buildings as you're decentralized and that the, we need a standalone ECC as a centralized model. So you'll have to decipher that language a little bit because they don't have the um, official terminology that you would have to use, but you'll get some of that response and the qualitative responses. And I'm not, I don't recall how we framed it, but with the PK question, did we let them know that this was something that could be coming down the pipe in terms of uh, governmental expectations of what would be funded in the future? We didn't get into that much okay. detail, but we did say in the video and in okay. other publications mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the state is moving toward universal yes. preschool okay. and we want to be ready for that in partnership with our community. Okay, good. Thank you. 
Is there an age specification from the state for preschool? Yeah, the, the language, when they say preschool and they're talking about universal preschool, it's really for four-year-olds. Uh, of course, behind the scenes conversation that that will evolve over time uh, to move into three, three-year-olds. But right now it's, it's funding for four-year-olds. Anything else? So open invitation as you all process this and think about it more. Uh, my commitment is, as I said before, to keep uh, good documentation around this. So as you have questions, please email those to me. I will get answers and share them back out. Again, we'll put uh, information that we find on our web page as well. So please don't let questions go unanswered, or if you dig into this a little more and just see it slightly differently, I'm happy to have that conversation, and then we'll bring that back to the whole group at that November 11th workshop. Thanks, Penny. All right, at this time, we'll move into agenda, agenda item number five, request to address the board. A couple of people that signed up. Early, Renita Bonadies. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. Yes, thank, thank, you, Kelsey. thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Have a great night. Thank you. Good evening, Renita Bonadies. Last month, President Rausch announced for public comment that I admit I had not practiced as board president that we do require name and then address. The same address information being requested is redacted in responses to my FOIA request. Addresses are not considered personally identifiable information, PII, since they can be found everywhere and are not like social security numbers. Now the board has decided to follow a policy two, and a half, two years after it was adopted on June 22nd of 22 under the previous board president. So the board is okay with asking for PII by your definition to be put on public record. I realize you say they can give the information to Sarah after they speak. However, a new person to these meetings would not know that they were giving information which is considered to be PII by the district when they state it. Why request it in one situation while redacting it in another? Is this to put a speaker at risk or to intimidate someone from speaking? And by the way, the Open Meeting Act has no requirement that the public give this information to make public comment. It is something that the board chose to add to their policies and now to enforce. The board began putting these three paragraphs of threatening wording in the public comment section of the agenda almost three years ago. This board has continued with this language, which ends with, if the speaker is unsure of the legal ramifications of what they're about to say, the district urges them to consult first with a legal advisor. The requirement to have these three paragraphs is not in the policy manual, but the superintendent and board have refused to remove it and go back to the previous wording of the Board of Education will receive public comment. That does sound so much more inviting for the public to participate in these meetings. Finally, I submitted a letter to the board, and I'm not sure you received it, as it's not noted on the agenda nor in the agenda packet. Did you receive it? It was a copy of the letter to the editor about the missed opportunity at the so-called town hall meeting held last month. 
It is available online at the Midland Daily News website, and I have copies if anyone is interested. I would like to know what determines whose letters to the board get listed on the agenda. Either all the letters to the board, including FOIA requests, should be noted as they have been for over a decade. Oh, wait. I did see you took care of that already. This month, the agenda was switched from correspondences to and from the Board of Education to simply correspondences from the Board of Education. I guess the public transparency has yet again been moved by the superintendent who is responsible for preparing the agenda in coordination with the board president, according to the policy manual. Thank you for once again showing the public just how much you want this to be an open and transparent process of doing business. As our elected public servants and your employee, you need to do better. Thank you. Next on the list is Joe Bonadies. Greetings to President Rausch. What happened on September 6th at Central Auditorium was not a town hall. Full stop. Moving on. Thank you for sharing the population estimate for the bond. It appears you spent $500 to get a study with many assumptions. The most concerning assumptions are ignoring the fact that the U.S. is below replacement rate and the population is shrinking. And two, that there were, will be no increase in homeschooling or other alternatives over the next 10 years. Mask the kids again and you'll probably watch homeschooling rise again. Quick background for the next part. My father retired in 1989 after 45 years in a union job with a good pension. It was, however, not indexed for inflation, so he currently has a negative monthly cash flow, and we know the ravages of long-term inflation. So now we go to the marketing ploys for the bond proposals. In the past, we had a shrinking fund, and it had a start and an end with a finite period. That was the first one. When we moved to the 2015 bond, and I, like many, was not paying attention to the fact that you basically wrote a second mortgage on my house, paying that full 2.95 millage for 20 years and tailing out to 35 years. Now you are wanting another round of bonds and speak only of the increase in the millage. I view this as highly misleading as the 2.95 is continuing and all versions of the 2025 bond get you over six mils and we will be paying on that beyond 2055. There's a quick plot of the total mills with some assumptions on the rate of reduction on the latter half. The numbers out to 2035 match your FAQs. And show the second one. And here is the same graphic in dollars, but that there's a light blue arrow that shows the rate of increase in the taxable value of my house over the last three years. All inflation, no improvements. Even assuming no hyperinflation, I'm on my way to $800 a year in 10 years thanks to compounding. I took the liberty of adding your 2035 bond to this since your behavior looks like you feel entitled to that too. And I talked inflation, if I talk inflation under that, I'm on my way to over $1,000 a year. Please feel free to make your version of total millage over time instead of the increased smokescreen, and I'll gladly use that in future talks. From my perspective, you wrote an inflation adjusting mortgage on my house in 2015, and you want to write another one in 2025. Your regular budgets have ballooned from 80 million in 2019 to over 110 million now, and third graders still can't read. So why should taxpayers fund these dreams while it's not working? Thank you. Oh, I got 22 seconds, you can go. I was in a focus group, and I was glad to be in a focus group. You still have a lot of people really pissed off about closing five elementary schools uh, several years ago, and the fact that you looked like an automobile salesman with a a feature package of three hyper three ads instead of having them split out was found to be interesting. Thank you. Anybody else want to address the board? Welcome. Hi, my name is Jessica Burdick. Um, I just have a couple things um, from the original uh, December 18th, um, I don't know, announcement to the town hall on October 1st. Scenario A, scenario B, and B plus, there was 
a 37 to $42 million increase in between those three scenarios. Well, where did that increase come from? I'm just curious. And then um, from tonight's discussion, obviously I haven't been able to process everything. None of us really have. But with the preschool um, or pre-K being in with the elementary school, in my mind, I'm thinking three and four-year-olds with 11 and 12-year-olds. Let's fast forward that into older kids scenarios. That's putting like 11-year-olds with 18-year-olds. I don't think we would put 11 year olds with 18 year olds you know so why are we putting three and four year olds with 12 year olds that's just my thought but um and then as far as the extracurricular things I would like to see what are the possible scenarios or um, outcomes that our students might be able to see because in my mind I know you guys have said time and time again that this might enhance our auxiliary departments, um, arts, music, et cetera, but I don't see how that's happening. You know, um, I had a discussion with somebody else about the, the marching band showcase and one school could barely fit on the, I don't know, the field. Um, combining Midland and Dow, if Midland can't fit on a field, how is Midland and Dow going to fit on one field? So just just some things that have popped into my head um, that I wanted to share. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. Anybody else? Mm. Rosemary Roberts, I would like to have some sort of guarantee that if I make, take time out of my day and get ready to come to this meeting on November 11th, it's not going to be another preaching to me about your opinion of how things should go. I was incensed by the fact that I came on that Monday night, made time, and I got the same routine that I got by coming to this meeting. I expected to be able to hear other people's opinions. I got none of that. Four questions. So I just want to make sure that this open meeting on November 11th that I put on my schedule is going to truly be an open meeting and you will really hear what the public has to say. Like when we said we want option A, you're trying to convince me now that the community doesn't want that. You're trying to convince me that you need to convince the public otherwise. That's not what we want to hear. We want to hear we're being heard. And I'm a senior, and to think that I have to pay another $1,000 a year in taxes, possibly? Are you kidding me? Let's be realistic and be real about what people can afford. Yes, educate them. I want to know where my money's going. But also know that we don't want to pay just to have something really glamorous. I want my grandkids to be raised correctly and educated. But I'm not willing to pay $1,000 more a year for some fluff and whatever. Thank you very much. I Sorry for the agitation, but I get that way. Anybody? <clears throat> Hi, my name's Emily Dixon, and I just want to share a little bit of insight. Um, and a couple of comments. Uh, I was part of one of the focus groups. I'm a PTO president at one of the elementary schools uh, in town. And I think in talking about scenario A versus B was um, some of the inequality that you may see income-wise if we add another elementary school and it's further north in the district and that sort of thing. Um, and then just how that, I guess, drives a wedge uh, as kids go through school. Um, what I would like the board and you know the community to look at is that um, my second grader is in a class with 27 other kids and Plymouth second graders are in a class with maybe 18 or 19 other kids right so we might be talking about the inequality in income or you know economic status or whatever but when it comes to learning and class size and um, 
how many students are just in the building alone with zero extra space you know in some buildings that are housing 600 and some kids that are really only meant for 400 and some kids um, I think that's a bigger picture to look at instead of just uh, where those economic lines are drawn with that uh, also with bringing pre-k into buildings in scenario a and scenario a and b and my perception is a parent with a student at one of these really full schools is that doesn't really get rid of the problem with overcrowding in our school if we take out fifth graders but then add in pre-k right there we're still using up every little bit of space um, that's needed and as for uh, I, I've heard the term the whole child a lot tonight and I think it's um, unfortunate that we can't focus more on um, providing for the whole child right now as we look at our facilities in terms of playgrounds, um, equipment, um, you know, field trips and, and that type of thing uh, because it's kind of a sad state when you look at it, which and for me, which is why scenario A is a bit more appealing, right? Because it caters a bit more to um, leaving more for elementary schools instead of all the focus being on this one big high school and then these transitions, right? Because then elementary school kids get left behind still. That's kind of how it felt um, when I looked at that. But I sincerely hope that our community, instead of just looking, I'm sorry, at tax dollars and how much that's gonna raise, is that we, uh, like grandkids, my kids, you know, they deserve um, the best that we can give them. And it's our job, like we're here now, to do this with our school board and to help create the idea of what that looks like. Um, but for that to come down to dollars is a little heartbreaking for me, but thank you. Thank you. Hey, y'all. Um, so my name is Christy Crow. Um, three minutes is not gonna be long enough for all the things I was going to say, but I'm just going to read this out to you as fast as I'm going to be able to do this. Um, cost is an issue, of course. Um, there's no argument there. Um, but like you'd mentioned, uh, what is this going to look like in 50 years? Forget five, forget 10, forget 20. What is this going to look like when we are gone? Like, buried us gone. You said the schools currently are between 50 and 100 years old and they're still somewhat manageable they're not going to be soon and that's understandable there's no way around it but what is this going to look like in the future the usefulness of each of these buildings if you scrap one the next one's going to have to hold out for another 50 to 100 years and we're not going to be around to argue about it Furthermore, uh, in that, I don't remember which one it was, which option it was, but the safety protocols would be added. My question is, would it be wise to put more kids under one roof? You're talking about adding another 1,000 kids under one roof. Uh, bullying is, has been a concern on the rise for years upon years, and we just watched you vote on expelling two students for fighting. Um, I don't know how large our juvenile facility is, but it might get maxed out if we're talking about adding all these kids together without some help. Since some support, mental health is also an issue that we need to take into consideration as well. Um, and of course, with the two schools combining, you're talking two rival schools, which I would assume would go as good together as putting Michigan State and State together under one roof. There's going to be a lot of hate in that first few years because that's that's what this is right like the the rivalry the back and forth and what is that going to do for the community what is that going to do like i said for the bullying issue um and our lack of extracurriculars um like i said the schools need to be updated i get that let's be smart about it the year's well behind beyond what we're going to be here it's like you said, you know, this is for this is for our littles and the future of Midland. If we cannot provide something to worth staying for, they're gone. 
I was gone for 18 years and I don't recognize anyone here. I, anyone from when I lived here before. Most of my graduating class is in different states. Um, and I know there's a lot of them that also left. So we have to consider what we're giving them to stay for. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions um, regarding scenario A with the new school and the um, pre-primary. I seen on Gretchen Whitmer's website where she's trying to push as much daycare, you know, for preschool age children. Is that why the push is for scenario A more to add more like pre-primary pre-K space? Why can't we just build a like where Carpenter is just add another preschool that would solve the one issue and then just add another elementary for scenario a I, I think that would solve a lot of problems i just can't support scenario b i have an eighth grader um, that just got first chair on saxophone um so i see for her future you know she would have <laughs> limitations for more competition if within a combined high school i did go to um, the band showcase, it was awesome, but Dow High has the largest band in the district, and combining Dow High and Midland High, I mean, it would be huge. I just, I see the vision of A, but it cannot support B. Thank you. Anybody else? Just can I offer a clarification? Yep. I want to make sure that board members understand the purpose and intent of that November 11th board workshop. That is an open meeting. There will be an opportunity for public comment, as there are at all open meetings. But this is a workshop for the seven of you to engage in dialogue as a team to grapple with the additional information provided and work toward consensus. I wanna make sure you all understand that this is not an interactive process with the community in the confines of that meeting. The interaction with the community came through the survey, the focus groups, and all of the conversations that I know you all have been having with the community. I just wanted to make sure we were clear about that. And just some further feedback, kind of following up on that two penny, you know, Rosemary, we're not, by any means trying to usurp the will of the voter. I think, you know, what we uh, talked about tonight was extracting some further feedback from the data. Um, if you have any additional questions or comments, please feel free to email me or, or any of the board members um, as well. I do, just a couple other things. When it comes to pre-K and pre-primary, I want to make sure that we address both scenarios, address pre-primary and pre-K. Okay. We're trying to address a critical need in our district and to address a critical need for our students and our families in both scenarios. When you think about one of the questions asked tonight about space at Carpenter, We could build another building next to where Carpenter is. That's another building, and it's even more money than what's already talked about in A and B. So the thought about utilizing the space that we have was trying to be the best fiduciaries of the money uh, that we're potentially going to ask the taxpayers for. And then finally, um, you know, around safety in particular it is a concern that we're trying to address equally in both potential scenarios so um, just want to make sure that those, those um, clarifications were made right now okay so I will close the floor at this time and please remember you can email any of us at any time um, if you have further comments or conversation. Do we need to 
vote to extend? Um, probably we could do that quickly. A motion to extend to 945. So moved. Support. Support. I think we're going to need more than 940. Sorry. Oh, I forgot about. Yes. Let's so um, oh, make a motion to it. Motion to extend to 10 o'clock. So moved. Support. support. Motion by Hatfield. Support by McFarland. Any questions or discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? It's empty. Reluct <laughs> reluctant. <laughs> reluctant. <laughs> All right. The brownies so got to leave before their bedtime. It's <laughs> 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 bringing some humor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, All right. Uh, item number six: curriculum instruction and assessment. Item six point one: CIA study committee meeting notes. Um, from September 16th. Got those. That's me. Curriculum instruction and assessment. CIA study committee meeting notes. Meeting date 916. Those present, myself as chair, Ann Horowitz, Jen Ringold, Ken Weaver, Penny Miller Nelson, and Brian Bruton. Our guests were Troy Lynch, Amanda Sherry, and Terry Handley. We met at the Northeast Middle School Media Center. The meeting started at 1.30 p.m. Our first topic covered was artificial intelligence and the future of education. Mr. Troy Lynch presented an artificial intelligence, AI, and its impact on the future of education. This topic was a staff development proposal presented to interested staff during the summer. The next topic was Midland Public Schools Resiliency or Rise. Mrs. Amanda Sherry presented on the Middle, Midland Public Schools Resiliency Program, which utilizes resources from the Resilience in Students and Educators, or RISE. The presentation focused on future plans at the secondary level for the program. School Resource Center, SRC. Mr. Hanley presented on restorative practices used in the School Resource Center at Northeast Middle School. The meeting adjourned at 2.45 p.m. Our next meeting is not today but is a week from today. Yeah. So that will be on the 28th. Um, one little side note, uh, Troy was very thorough in his presentation and gave us um, some examples and some tests and some hands-on things that we interacted with him. And I also took that opportunity to take it home with me and download chat GPT and worked with <laughs> my students, my two boys at home and rolled it out for them and, and we went through some real life scenarios and it was phenomenally awesome. We are, with my 10th graders in geometry, we're doing proofs and all the definitions that go along with proofs. We asked chat GPT for a summary of all of the definitions and all of the words with all the definitions it produced it immediately and then we followed up after that with asking chat gpt for a 25 question quiz on the topic and it was produced in about 14 15 seconds hmm. yeah. he went through and all of the questions were exactly relevant to the topic and it was an instantaneous study aid that he could use to try to help with a, a difficult subject. And I thought it was great to be able to help him and give him a different look at the exact same topic that he's been covering in school. Hmm. So cool. I think it's a, something that the district will be utilizing piece by piece and I encourage all of our teachers to be familiar and be able to share that with the children. And I know they all are, but it was a good experience. Thanks, Brad. Item 6.2 for information textbook adoption. Ken. Yeah, we've got uh, for tonight for presentation just uh, and for information only tonight um, for Mrs. Uh, Felby at uh, Dow High School. We've got a German book. Uh, it is written in German. It is for the IV German class. Um, and she's completed all the paperwork, so it's just for your information. I'm busy reading it right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Can you see some chat GPT? 
Yeah, I may need the <laughs> good point. Thank you. Item number seven, finance facilities and operations. Uh, 7.1 FFO study committee from October 7th. Thanks, Phil. The FFO committee met on October 7th. Uh, I was present, as was Brad Blasey, Scott McFarland, Penny Miller Nelson, Brian Brutin, and Anna Wamack. Uh, we had no guests present. Uh, item number one was the July and August financials. The July and August financials were reviewed with the committee. Variances from year to year were discussed. July and August see a large amount of purchase orders annually due to fiscal year startup operations. Facility study. The committee discussed the progress of the community survey as well as the FAQ document that was released. The next FFO meeting will be November 4th of 2024. 5 p.m. It's not, yeah, it's not. We will be at 5 p.m. Thanks, John. Item 7.2 gifts totaling $40,000 for action. Anna. Yes, tonight we have two items tonight totaling $40,000 requiring your acceptance on behalf of the board this evening. These items are $25,000 from the HH Dow High All Sports Boosters for cross country, football, golf, tennis, swimming, soccer, volleyball, basketball, cheer, wrestling, bowling, hockey, palm, softball, lacrosse, baseball, and track. And additionally, there's $15,000 from the Arthur C. Frock Endowment Fund for staff appreciation, recruitment, and retention. We would request that you would approve accepting these gifts this evening. Take a motion for item 7.2. I move the adoption of 7.2 to accept the gifts as proposed. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Hatfield. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Item 7.3 for information. Gifts, Anna. We also have additional gifts tonight totaling $19,375, representing support from programs ranging from various sports teams at both high schools, robotics teams at Northeast and Dow High, Midland High's National Honor Society, Dow High's DECA program, and the Max Musing Memorial Scholarship. As is tradition, all donors are going to be recognized in the credits of this evening's broadcast and also through board correspondence on your behalf. We are grateful for our community support of our students and our programs. Perfect, thank you. Thank you to everybody that donated. Item number eight is human resources. Um, HR study committee did not meet since our last board meeting. Item 8.1 for information, um, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, the below staff member announced retirement effective on the date listed. Uh, Ms. Shelby Thompson, paraprofessional Seabird Elementary School, uh, retired effective 10-11-24. Then I can continue. Yes, we are ready uh, for 8.2. The board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the following families. Uh, so first, our condolences to the family of Miss Wendy Julian. She passed away September 13, 2024. Wendy was employed with MPS for over 20 years as a special ed teacher, most recently at Woodcrest, but during her tenure with MPS, she also taught <clears throat> at Longview Elementary, Chestnut Hill, and Adams. And then second, our condolences to the families of Ms. Uh, family of Ms. Sal Sally Berry. She passed away September 21st, 2024. She was employed with MPS as a fifth and sixth grade teacher at Woodcrest Elementary. She also taught a combined fourth and fifth grade classroom during that time period. She retired in 1994 with 24 years of service. Thanks, Jeff. Item number nine, Correspondence from the Board of Education um, to the following organizations or individuals listed in the agenda packet, number 9.1. Item number 10 are scheduled activities for information. All meetings um, are listed as follows in the uh, agenda packet, noting that we have a special meeting which is the facility planning workshop on November 11th at 7 p.m. 
Item number 11, our study session discussion. Any points of clarification on the topics we discussed tonight? I do have a question about the proposed 2025 meetings. Are we only having the one <coughs> meeting in January and not an organizational meeting separate? Is the first question. And then the second question is the 20th and of January and the 17th of February are days with no school. And so wondering if those are like we did in 2024, if we're going to push to Tuesdays. Yeah, so. we'll update that. Um, I, I think that was a desire of the board last time to, yeah. to not have it on those days. So Just open for. We'll, we'll confirm that. Okay. Yeah. We'll look at Penny and I will look at the calendar. Okay. Good, good catch. Um, anything else? Turn it over to Penny for 11.2. I'll hold my comments with the exception of this one. You know, um, two expulsions on today's agenda. It's, it's not what we want for kids. Yeah. It's not what we want for our school community. Thank you to the board members who um, serve on that team uh, to hear those. Jeff does a really nice job of communicating with families the path forward, uh, keeping them connected with an educational experience, and uh, really trying to, to turn things around for them. So I just, I just felt the need to say that we don't take those decisions lightly. These are life-altering moments, and we want to do right by kids. So thank you for those of you who sit in on those meetings. And thanks to Jeff for his work with those students and families. And, and Penny, just to draw that out a little bit more, there is a very defined path forward, right? These kids are not just yes, thank kicked you. out the door and left to blow in the wind. They are still get wraparound services. Yes. And, and I, I've i sat on a lot of these, sadly. Um, and, and there are a number of success stories where kids have come back to the district after being expelled for a year um, and, and are thriving because they got the help that they needed. They got the services that they needed. So, so it's important to know vague high level language about a student being expelled but there's a lot more that goes into that and we do not forget about kids period and it's still our requirement that they fall under our auspices so correct yeah, i thank I you think that's something that we need to make sure the public understands yes. thanks to you both for that clarification again jeff does a good job of keeping them connected through our online learning and making sure that they have the support they need in hopes that we can eventually restore that relationship and bring them back in when, when they're ready and have proven that they're ready. So thank you. I have no other comments for the evening. I will note that this is uh, kind of the end of our fall sports season. So we, uh, we had some pretty successful teams already wrap up their fall sports season. So um, it's been exciting to watch, watch the, the successes that they've had and then Obviously a big Friday night this week, so hopefully come out to watch um, both football and, and the bands. And we'll have both bands. Both bands both on one field. It's always pretty clear, pretty cool. Yeah. Little night too. Um, so look forward to that every year. So um, with that, item number 12 is uh, closed session for discussion on collective bargaining strategy as permitted under MCL 15.268, Section 8C. So I move that we go to, oh, I got it. where is it? I move, move that we move into closed session for collective bargaining strategy as permitted under MCL 15.268, Section 8C. Support. Support. And Phil, do you want to remind folks there'll be no action item and no other comments after the Correct. closed session? Yes. All so right. If, so roll if you call. you want to come back, Sorry. you don't need to. Yeah. But you're welcome to. <laughs> All right. Roll call. President Raj? Yes. Vice President McFarland? Yes. Secretary Hatfield is a yes. Treasurer Lauterbach? Yes. Member Blazy? Yes. Member Ringgold? Yes. Member Horowitz? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, Phil.
All right, since we're now back in open session, do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Support. Support. All in favor, say aye. 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 Stand adjourned.